there shines Brahman. May that Brahman protect us. May that Brahman sustain us. And may that Brahman illumine our thinking process. May we not find fault with each other, with the world, or with the teachings. And may what we study be a source of inspiration to us eternally. Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us, and may peace be unto all. Om Hari Om Hari Om Hari Om Sat. After at least a month of Sundays, if not more, we've gathered here for our continuation of our class series on various subjects. And this particular one today is one I selected during the week that had to do with the hybrid of Vedanta and yoga, <clears throat> how that works together so well. It put me in mind of, of reading the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, which many of us did. Fortunately for myself in my early 20s, it's the first book, spiritual book, I really picked up and held and read from cover to cover. So I came straight to the great master fortuitously. And reading in that book, um, my first reading, I could still remember far back <coughs> because uh, I uh, got to that book even before I met our founder, Lex Hickson, who's my great spiritual friend and compatriot, who uh, was the main founder of SRV here. That's why we're busy with all of this SRV transmission of Dharma and Atmagyan. So reading in that book the first time, and then a few years later again, and then again and again, till um, even just in the last few days I've been searching through it for certain things. And now they have a concordium for it and all sorts of beautiful things to add to the mix so that we can find quickly and easily these things that we're looking for that we want to share with others, as I'll be doing today with you for an hour or more. <clears throat> but the reason I bring it up is that later on when um, students began to come to SRV and they began to read the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna for the first time, um, I was already beginning to bring out facets of, uh, of it in terms of, of uh, Samkhya, mainly Tantra, secondly, and then yoga, because you really don't find a lot of Vedanta in, in, in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. He, he's not talking about it long, all that much. He brings it up in terms of the Ganis and what they study, the Nati Nati path. So all of this isn't readily available to Westerners and so that they can plug in to what it is that they're reading and where it comes from, what period of history and so you see kind of where I'm getting at then is that basically um, Sri Ramakrishna and his divine consort Sri Sharda Devi pretty much lived as a, as a totally consecrated um, tantric couple together. And uh, he was Paramahamsa and Guru and later known as an avatar and had these, all these wonderful pure students coming to him. Uh, there, when after he finished his period of of uh, discipleship, you might say at the Kali Temple and the priest there worshiping Mother Kali, and so back to bring it back to the current here is that when I started sharing these facets out of the gospel and letting people know that this is what they were imbibing when when they read a word like say tatva. Uh, which we looked at over the last couple months before our recent trip to India. We just got back from a pilgrimage to India with a dozen of us. <clears throat> so, um, looking at um, what was in the gospel became something to be shared. And uh, along with it, though, and I won't go into it in depth, because, again, you hear so much Samkhya there, and you don't know what Samkhya is if you're a Westerner. And you barely know what Vedanta is, so you're just getting started on that path. The Swamis have come, and 
you know, to the West uh, after Vivekananda and started Vedanta Center. So you come to know the word and all of that. And then the, the practices that Sri Ramakrishna was, was doing when he was younger, particularly, were pretty much tantric practices. And if you have any knowledge of that, you know, they're very strange, these practices, especially for the Western sensibility. You know, go, go to the graveyard and meditate. If you see a corpse that hasn't been buried yet, sit there and meditate on it. You know, kind of, you know, the Westerner's going to raise his eyebrows and wonder what that's all about. Maybe think it rather superstitious or, or rather archaic or maybe had nothing to do with religion, but this is the hands-on part of religion in India is the Tantra. And I've just been talking with a couple of people over the past few days about how they're, they're skittish about getting into it because it's been, they've heard it's been desecrated over time that, and, uh, and also that uh, the practices are are very difficult, and the whole tantric material is very technical. I mean, yoga is technical enough, Patanjali's yoga system, but tantra far outstrips it in terms of length of time that it's been there and the practices that have come about through it, the tantras, the puranas, the agamas, all these scriptures that are behind it. <clears throat> and a lot of that hasn't been put into English like, say, the Upanishads have now, and the Bhagavad Gita came readily to us over time. So, uh, bringing that up because mainly, try to get to the point here, is that um, when people found out that there was so much in the Gospel, and they had already set themselves on the Vedantic path, you know, I'm following Vedanta now through Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, but particularly through Swami Vivekananda, because he was more well known to us, he came here to the country and so forth. And Sri Ramakrishna was still kind of, you know, this, this this very madcap kind of person there that was having ecstasies and various things that you didn't see when in Swami Vivekananda when he was here. You'd have to go to India with him to see him all of a sudden take on that ambiance of uh, of bhavas and moods and various things that you know, and he'd take off his his. Is don you know, the clothes that he donned for teaching over here formally, amongst you know Christian or uh, oriented people who were having a hard time with Christianity, of course. But but then come down to find out that all of these different things are a mixture in the gospel, and then the next problem, the hurdle with that was people saying, "Do we have to practice these?" I thought Vedanta was just this and this, you know, the Atman is pure and perfect and thou art that. That's pretty much what I want to know. I'm glad I heard the truth. Thank you. Can I walk away now? <laughs> and uh, But my students didn't see me doing that. They saw me very much involved in yoga ever since I was... Yoga, when, when I want to clarify here, is the eight-limb yoga of Patanjali, not the offshoots that are that are misleading people nowadays called Hatha, <coughs> which um, Sri Ramakrishna, Holy Mother, Swami Vivekananda, and Swami Brahmananda all, like said, you know, you know panned. They didn't, that wasn't what uh, yoga was. So when I was practicing yoga in my 20s, and I was, I was living a yogic lifestyle and becoming a yogi, and that was my practice. I hadn't found Vedanta yet. So Vedanta as a statement of truth started to come through me, to me through the through the, uh, the gospel. And then the Gita was coming about the same time, and I started to imbibe a lot of Sri Krishna's teachings about Vedavyas and Kapila, and you know, people that he cites in the Gita to be the great rishis of India who were not uh, uh, like Kapila, was pretty much you know, the, the composer of the Samkhya system. And so it seemed like you couldn't really mix that too much with the dance unless you knew something about the philosophy. So yes, I finally told my students to cut the chase. Yeah, Vedanta isn't, you don't, the Vedanta that you hear is not enough. You have to start practicing. And some of this is going to entail, and some of you, if you've been with me long enough, remember dropping the tantric bomb on you back in the early days of SRV and giving my first tantric teachings to everyone that was with me at the time and how shocked people were, how, how amazed they were, what a beautiful system, an honorable system, because I had to tell people recently that I, I don't teach the, you know, what, what's maybe said is the left-handed path kind of, of Tantra that people over here kind of get, you know, 
excited by and interested in, like, oh, imbibing of alcohol and having of sexual relations. And these things got mixed into it. And then you know, that's part of what caused its downfall in India centuries earlier, what to speak of coming to America and having people here misunderstand the system. So I had to tell them I'm teaching the Noble Tantra, the tenets of Tantra. And that, yes, you're going to have to find out some technical terms that are going on. And, and by the way, these technical terms will be very much like what you're hearing in the Tattvas of Samkhya. 24 Tossing Principles are one of the first teachings I gave out in SRV back 30 years ago. Because I knew people needed to know that because that was the ancient divine wisdom. So how could you really jump forward to Veda Vyasa, who is in a more current age, and understand what Veda Vyasa is saying if you didn't understand what Kapila was saying millennia before him? And father of yoga falling somewhere in between there in one of his incarnations. So I'm starting out this first series of four classes with this, that uh, right now we're looking towards this topic of Vedanta and yoga together. And I know as I went around myself teaching Vedanta from the platform of, of the Ramakrishna order and Swami Vivekananda and SRV when it finally came into into existence, that I was going to centers that were called Yoga Vedanta centers. They actually had that on the doorway back in the 70s and 80s. If you drove up there and you were going to give a talk or we would give a sacred music event, there would be their you know, Yoga Vedanta center. So it became obvious that some other people in India besides Swami Vivekananda early on had, had been practicing the dovetailing of these two great darshanas. I mean, there are six, six darshanas, you might know. You probably can remember three or four of them right now, and the other two are sort of, you know, just have been absorbed by the other four. But, but basically, yoga and Vedanta are the first two that come to mind. And again, Sampya has kind of, you know, fallen back. It should be brought forward and taught, as we have been doing here in SRB. So when we put together Yoga and Vedanta, I had to think of a short, concise title, so I pretty, pretty much just said, you know, Vedanta is eternal truth, and yoga is uh, storing of power. And these are the two things, if you look at those two darshanas that you see, that when you look at Vedanta, and is why, is why that you probably didn't hear enough of that in the gospel, um, in terms of the, the uh, axioms of Advaita Vedanta. Sharma Krishna was in the non-dual state too often to be able to be talking about it that much. Uh, so you are seeing an example of somebody who is already in the state of the philosophy that you wanted to study to find out what it was all about. <laughs> so it didn't work really well uh, through a book particularly, but when the Swamis came and you read Swami Vivekananda and his lectures when he was here, you started hearing you know, him bring out some of these axioms, what I like to call axioms of Advaita Vedanta. The self is pure and perfect and so forth. And there's a, there's a whole list of them that we can run through real quick to get us into this. But that being the case, then, uh, this is what you like to hear if you're interested in the path of Vedanta, before you even called yourself a Vedantist. I, mean, I know people have been into Vedanta for, for decades and they still don't call themselves a Vedantist. Um, so it's something that people are very interested in. They like the ring of the truth in it. And, but to commit yourself to it um, uh, and to go very deep in it, you're going to have to probably take a teacher, as is any good Indian path would tell you, path or preceptor would tell you, and then start practicing. And there's no real practice in Vedanta. There's just, here's the truth, read it, accept it, live in it. So where is the practice? You know, so early on we came up with this, with this because people were were assuming that they could be perfect without practice. And that that was that was a second problem with that that whole attitude that people took on in the West. Tantra was one, and then this idea that oh, I'm already perfect came along. There, that's it. I got it. I remember. I've got perfect memory again all of a sudden, even though I just spent 30, 40, 50 years of my life in a haze, but all of a sudden I've recovered, you know. And there's no karma attached to that either. So we're kind of looking at that, scratching your head and going, hmm, that kind of awakening is a little bit suspicious. When we saw a different kind of awakening or an ever-awake state, 
and other people like Swami Vivekananda when he was here. Our own great master here in the, in, in the state, Swami Sheshanandaji Maharaj. So you went from this, these Vedantic axioms and you said, well, how do I practice? So we came up with that phrase, Advaita Vedanta Sadhana, <clears throat> because we had it on corroborated and on good, uh, good testament that Shankar himself reached perfection and then kept practicing. And he gave two reasons for that. Number one is that the mind will become uh, covered with cosmic dust of the collective mind around you, of nature. We'll get into that in a minute. Uh, and it'll get attracted to different kinds of powers. Basically, that's how I want to start the class off by talking about power, because Vedanta is just a statement of truth. And you might, you might as well just call that God's power. Renunciation is one of God's power. The human being itself is one of God's power. Love is one of God's power. These are, you know, they may sound like qualities or attributes, but when you put them in the divine atmosphere, these are the, the green of the tree. They're not just an ornament on a tree. These are the actual uh, innate essence of truth. You know? So if you were having a time when you were young looking for truth and you couldn't find it, and you were having people talk about relative truth, or then they talk about, oh, there's your truth and then there's my truth, or there's the truth of that religion and then there's the truth of this religion, and you were floating around there for a while, like this figure in our new chart we'll look at, and, uh, and you didn't know which way to go, to surface, to dive deep, or just to stay there, floating in some silty waters of the intellect, like, you know, opacity all around you. So basically, you decided then that, like Shankar, that the second reason why you keep up this uh, practice is to be an example to others, so they'll do it. So all of a sudden you had everything you needed to become an Advaita Vedanta sadhana, sadhanast. See, you, 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 could, you could, without any recriminations from people who thought that they were already attained or already in samadhi or already illumined, without any regrets whatsoever, you can say, yeah, I still practice. I still offer a flower on my guru slippers. Uh, you know, I, I, I still uh, ponder the truths of Vedanta and um, even play devil's advocate with it all the time. Is that true? Is that not true? Why is it true? Why isn't it true? I still use my mind that way, you see. That's what makes the mind facile. And I was just talking to someone yesterday, say, oh, if I don't do these jobs, you know, I'll get all sore and uh, I'll go mad. I can't sit still. I have to do this work, you know. So that's the same with the mind. If you just let the mind sit in its own juices for a while, you know, unless you have an abiding peace of mind that you can always fall back on. But, you know, who has that? Like Kolima said, you need that first and foremost. Then basically you're going to have to um, uh, exercise it, exercise that tool of mind. And it has to be exercised in the right way. So this is my preamble again to Yoga Vedanta as a, as a hybrid. Uh, Vedanta is giving you the truth, and yoga would be the, the, the next best darshana. I mean, Tantra, we're just kind of figuring this in soon. But yoga as a practice would be the next best, best thing for storing up power from what you hear in the Vedanta. Because you know that the, the Sri Krishna said you have a, this, this vase and pour honey in it. And you sit it there. Later you come back and you see the honey seeping out because you didn't notice there were little cracks in this face, little tiny ones, and it's oozing out over time. Well, he was using that story as the human mind that should be storing up this yogic power. And of course, it won't store up any power via asana. It won't store up much power via breathing exercises. Um, uh, it won't, you know, it'll try to get health out of those things. And then health will go awry when the mind thinks disease the body will get unhealthy. When the mind thinks health, it'll stay healthy. So you haven't yet reached a place where you've taken your mind and purified it. Purified your location, purified your acts, and purified your mind. Those are the three of the great powers, the great Mahasiddhas, 
is that act of purification of mind. And then you get Chichuti. That's what they're born with, these great souls. While you don't see them necessarily having to practice as hard as you do or you have in the past. And why they're getting immediate fruits, as Holy Mother said. They're getting all their mangoes in season. And you're still getting sour mangoes out of season because you don't have this, you're not Akamai as we see in Hawaii. You're not in the know about this Advaita Vedanta mixed with this power storage. So I was in this group of people once, uh, 100,000 of them, and um, called the Kalpataru Day celebration in Kasapur, which just got over on January 1st. A Swami came out of the crowd and said, Babaji, I have your power. I didn't even know this man. And so he reached in his cloth and gave me this package and I walked away into the crowd. I uncovered it. It was this little picture of Sri Krishna. This was like 20 years ago, so I keep that little picture still. I have your power. Here it is. So this is what's meant by you know the storage of power. Uh, you do practice with an ishtam, you know, like he's your eternal companion. He, she, uh, and every religion has an ishtam, so it's not difficult. You just have to choose, discriminate, see what's right for you, how it fits with your particular temperament, your character. Helps to have a guide early on for that, so you won't mischoose as people are doing, or get deluded or pulled away by false teachers and paths that go nowhere, you know, uh, <coughs> rivers that don't reach the ocean. <coughs> Sri Ramakrishna used to say. So you found this vehicle for storing up powers called yoga. So that's one of what I'm calling in this class series, delineation of the three powers. Basically, to give you an example of it, uh, and in fact, maybe we can just, so we make some headway in the actual material that I prepared for it. And hopefully it'll sweep you in as, as it, as it did did and does me, these just read this first quote at the top of this new chart called proper delineation delineation of three powers. Modern man, particularly in the West, has run up against a subtle hurdle of attraction to external nature, tempted initially by its outer beauty, then caught off guard by discovery of its inherent power. In those who, who manage to perceive and withdraw from these two misleading aspects of nature, the lure towards the metaphysical force lying at the occult levels of pranic life force and the human psyche then rises up, dis distancing the soul further from its own pure yogic power. Nature's power, mind's power, and the Lord's power. Only those who choose wisely and correctly attain to peace wisdom, and freedom. The rest will go spinning on in this cycle of samsara, to quote the Buddha. Or the rest will have uh, no fruits coming from their, their various endeavors in the world because they don't, they're not getting peace of mind and you can't attain anything without peace of mind. Any, if you try to attain things in restlessness of mind, that'll just, it's the honey out the cracks of the, of the, of the jar. You might think that you're storing up something, but then the next time you look, you don't have any, any energy around that. And this is particularly true of spiritual life, that it's very subtle to judge your progress spiritually. Holy Mother used to say this. We had a seminar on her last weekend, is why we weren't here with you on Sunday. Had a, a seminar called the Matri Avatar and uh, the Divine Mother practice. So. Um, she was saying that in some of her quotes. She said, it's very difficult to um, figure any headway in your spiritual practice. It's what your guru tells you. You're, you're doing fine, or well, hold on there, boy. Let's uh, you know, pull in the reins, and you, you, you've got misdirected. So, unfortunately, in the West, as I started out saying, they, there's been no guru to guide us, no spiritual practitioner in our neighborhood, no wise preceptor in our family or amongst our ancestors. Uh, and this, this is not just in the case of America, it goes back into Europe too, which America is just springing from Europe. So <clears throat> we didn't have anyone coming forward to point out to us that uh, probably one of the stunning of 
most of all realizations. And I just saw uh, evidence of it in India when I talked to some 14 swamis there. They'd all renounced nature. <laughs> they were living in renunciation of nature. So it's not like you have to come to the West and you say, you know, why are you attached to nature? And they have to say, well, that's all there is. You know, there's nothing but nature here. We're materialists. You can't tell us anything different. But you can go to another country, and they've renounced nature a long time ago, lifetimes ago, and they're not um, blindsided by its beauty anymore. You don't sit the Swami sitting around with a margarita looking at a sunset. You know, they're always talking to you about Brahman, and they, they want questions about Brahman from you, and they want to share what you know about Brahman. So these are true human beings, as Lexixon used to call them. And you don't see them you know, seeking out um, um, the gaining of personal power through storing up masses of resources in nature. So this is what I'm talking about here in this court. There are two things. Uh, so this, this is the first of the three delineations of power are these first two things. Yeah. One is that the, the beauty of nature um, blindsides us. And then you just become a nature lover. And it's, like I said, sunsets and, you know, various sports and activities. And uh, pretty soon you probably take up your vocation and that will also be in nature. So the, the beauty of attraction to nature is, is what's there. And then the second aspect of that, which is the same kind of power, is that if you do or if you are fortunate enough to wean yourself off of, of being hypnotized by the beauty of nature. Ah, it's one sunset, I've seen them all. Like the Abhutut, we had, we had his teachings on that. You know, Sunset in the morning, moon coming up at night, you know, forests, streams. I've seen it all, but I've never seen anything like the Atman. Ever. So, you know, if you're going to get entranced by something or hypnotized by something, you know, try your own consciousness. Try yogic power. You know, and if you don't have that, start storing it up. You know, pour the honey out of that cracked old vase and pour it into a nice polished silver bowl. Store that somewhere and add to it every day with your practices. Otherwise, remember last week's God blog, Swami Vivekananda was saying that there's this man that got into a boat and he really wanted to go somewhere and he was just pulling on the oars ferociously. So he had the right idea, the right effort and all that, but his boat was still moored to the harbor. He forgot to take the rope off, and he's just like struggling, trying to go somewhere, and he's going nowhere faster. So that's what people are like when they're trying to store up any other kind of power than the power that belongs to them already. Isn't it ironic? That's what they say when they talk about self-realization. That all that you need is within you. I mean, Christ couldn't have put it any clearly, any clearer about that. You know, uh, oh, you're the one you've been seeking all this time, the Tantra says. You're the darling of your own soul. It's you that you've been spending all this effort for. And going this way and that way and, and hither and thither and yon, as Vivekananda quoted from the Old English, trying to find something that's already within you. And Sharma Krishna laughs and says, yes, Naram, my boy, people are like musk deer running around looking for that fragrance on the wind, you know, but without knowing that that fragrance is coming from the musk deer's own navel. So, you know, if it stopped and just put its head down, sniffed its own navel, it would find out where that beautiful fragrance was actually coming from inside of itself. And otherwise, it's just lost in nature, running around here with the five senses, trying to catch a fragrance of this or a view of that or a sound of that, and uh, completely deluded by attraction to nature. So when we say renounce nature, I've seen evidence of hundreds of souls in my life who have renounced nature. It's no big thing. What's really amazing is that so many hundreds of thousands of people are still hypnotized by it. Because why? Nature forms things. And then you put names on them. And then those forms start to move and they bump into each other and cause karma. And karma has a repercussion. And this all happens in the sense of time and space. So you've got name, form, time, space, and cause and effect in nature. Krishna says it. Arjuna, none of that happens in your soul. In your it's all happening in nature. So then are you going to 
not seek your soul? Or are you going to refuse to renounce nature when everyone, when everything is pointing to the fact that you're being dumbfounded by it? Dumb has gone and found you. It's the meaning of that word. So give up this fascination with nature as quickly as you can. It's sentimental. It's emotional. You know, people, a lot of people I meet, they're still in shock about being born. I finally figured this out after a while. I said, why aren't they just waking up when they hear the words of Vedanta? Because we could cut this, you know, at least two-thirds of this next four weeks out of the picture and just talk about Vedanta, the actions of Vedanta, you know. They're right there. You can just read them out almost. Rama Sutra says there's like 11 of them. Some other scripture says there's like a dozen. Some say there's just three. So there's these main points about truth that if you just need to hear it, Shruti, once in your lifetime, to remember that that's the truth, and and then you can go ahead and start um, shaping yourself around that. But instead what's happening is nature's shaping you and then trapping a bit of your consciousness in its forms. So last week at the seminar, you know, we had that question I proposed it. You know, they thought that they were, had a great question when they said, what came first, the chicken and the egg? But I said, that was just not even a practical question because chicken and egg are both forms. Consciousness happens before form. So how can anything come first before consciousness, right? Consciousness is, uh, is anterior, not only to forms, but to life. Not only to life, but to mind. Because a lot of people are running back to the mind. See, these people are going to the surface, and a lot of people are running back to the mind. So there's a second kind of power you're up against. I didn't really finish the second type of the first kind of power. But basically it's that you got dumbfounded by nature through the senses. And then you spent your whole life like a nature lover. So you know, you see driving around with one of your old family or ancestors, say, look at the beauty of that tree. And you know, I'm sitting across from this person and saying, you've seen so many trees. Why are you, and you're 80 and you're still looking, looking at the beauty of that tree. You know, maybe you never once looked at the beauty of the source of the tree. I mean, down here we have it, you know, what's, what's Sri Ramakrishna say just to make this all very easily understandable. All beings who come here to earth the earth plane, get immediately entranced by the beauty of the garden. But very few ever think of seeking out the gardener. And and essentially in Advaita Vedanta, the gardener is you. You're the gardener. There's no God in Vedanta. There's no God in yoga. There's no God in Samkhya. There's no God in Buddhism. And there's no not God in any of them either. So the duality of God and no God, or existence and no existence, or, or any other duality you want to, perf- to, to uh, postulate or, or, or put up before the mind's eye to examine, you know, is not the point. The, the point is, is that existence is God. Your own consciousness is God, if you, if you will have to put a name on it. And that's formless. Arupa. So you've got rupa, then you've got arupa. So you have to, you know, think of these two together. You've got nama and you've got anama. You've got name and you've got something that's nameless. That's why the Jews and the Muslims, they won't name reality. So, you know, these are the tendencies of people who are following the influence of nature. They're not, they're not, in knowledge of the fact that nature is in them and, and that they can bring it forth and dissolve it, like you do with waking, dreaming, and deep sleep, right? Every, don't you bring forth worlds every night? I was in a world last night that was, that was Egypt, Egypt and Arabia. A couple of weeks before I went to India, I was in, it was in India, in a Kali temple. And the Kali temple that I saw when I was there was much different than the Kali temple in my dreams. Kali Temple in my dreams, you walked in through an opening, and then it was just a, a whole world. This one temple was a whole world of beings back there, doing rituals and learning things, worshiping the mother. Uh, so 
every every night you bring forth creations without number probably forget half of them and then you dissolve them back when you wake up you know so this goes on and on without you having a clue of who's doing this that thou art that <clears throat> so this is how uh, name and form and time and space and causality get precluded by consciousness and it's one of the few things that maybe the singular thing i could say is why pe people in the west don't understand indian advaita yet indian non-duality they've kind of come up with versions of advaita that they they call their own now that are vying for supremacy vivekananda said before he passed away in the early 1900s he saw this happening already he said the strongest one will outlive the rest so that one that's going to outlive the rest is this one that that refuses to settle in on nature having anything to do whatsoever with, with the with with reality it's an offshoot it's a reflection it's a changing phenomena and where is it coming from the mind God does not create in our tradition. You can't create something because there's nothing to create it out of. Everything is a create. That's what Vivekananda tried to tell us when he came here. And well, they need a word because there's so much into these creation theories and creation this and the creation that. Even my own people back in India, the tantrists and so forth, are really into this, you know, the secret of creation kind of thing. We need a word that can really just pinpoint and bring out this facet of formless reality. We'll call that a create. It's the opposite of anything that gets created. And that's the truth and that's formlessness with a capital F. So if you're still caught then in the flux of attraction to nature, then you're one of those many millions of people who are, then you'll have to go and find some holy company somewhere and see how uh, they have no interest or attraction in nature anymore, these people. You have to be amongst them. And, you know, first of all, it's like, what do they do? You know, what, what do holy people do sitting around just happy inside themselves? Why was Ramakrishna just like, you know, in bliss? He didn't own anything. He didn't have a bank account, no children. You know, so they're, they're contemplating uh, yogic power inside of themselves. They're contemplating the Mother Shakti, because her powers are all real, beneficial, substantial. Um, all the other forms of power are misleading. So let's go on with it. I mean, we can take examples as we go through, but basically that second, let's call it dimension of nature power, is that if you do happen to be one of those ones that gets over it, say, oh, I'm not that attracted to sunsets and this and that anymore, Kind of sentimental again you know so you've kind of gone a different direction all of a sudden you find out because of scientific advances that there's a huge amount of power out there even before you split the atom the, well i can amass some of this stuff and increase and increase what my influence over things it's all ego and so now you've, you've run a pot uh, you're running close to this second kind of power called occult power which is all done out of selfishness by the ego. But the ego is not the real person. The Purusha is the real person. So you're following this false idol. And again, if you got over false idols in religion, which you should do, and probably found out what a true idol in religion is, something that's real, like Ishvara or Shiva, and if you got over these false idols, then all of a sudden yourself steps in, you know, to take over that position. So that's bringing you up to this attraction to the power inherent in nature. So you understand what I'm saying? First it was a beauty, next it's its power. And there, there are, these are influences that something insentient, that's brought about to trap you with. And you trapped yourself. You're the trapper and the one trapped. 
Because if you look at a form, and that's what I was just saying a while ago, people are still in shock about being born because they can't believe they did this to themselves. Why are people unhappy? Because they took this boundless ocean of consciousness that they're swimming in all the time, and they dared it down into one little tiny form. And they stuffed consciousness in there called a body, and they were born as a fetus, and they grew, and they grew amongst other bodies that were growing. And the whole thing was done in nature, by nature's powers, and nobody ever informed them that, number one, they're not nature, and number two, that nature should be their bond slave, not the other way around. If you come into the realms of name and form, you should be the controller. And Father of Yoga said that, and then Father of Vedanta said that, and then Father of Sampkya said that. You go back to all these great teachers of these six darshanas, and you find out that, well, of course that's the truth. But it's, began, it's becoming forgotten as with the passage of time. Just like true religion, according to Krishna, it became forgotten over the passage of time. It doesn't take but a thousand years for that kind of forgetfulness to completely settle into the mind. But lo and behold, religion and, and rishis and luminaries decide the one thing that stumped us more than all is, is the production of nature out of our own minds. We've just trapped ourselves. And, and we're hypnotized by its beauty. And, and then all of a sudden we find out there's power and we rush to greedily uh, possess it. In these souls I'm talking about, and souls we've read about, there are open-handed policy on all that. I will not possess anything. I don't own anything. I'm not even an I. And that's the first part of, of delineation of these three powers we want to talk about. Just to put us on the same page, the second type is when um, they found out they find out that uh, that there's a an origin to nature's power, and this this sets him on an inner trajectory, and um, that could be the beginnings of a spiritual life, but it turns out to be attraction to occult powers. So Father of Yoga says, you know, they begin to see the connection between the power of nature and their own inner power. But what stands in the way is their attraction to the occult. They want to use this power, before they wanted to use this power to amass wealth and to influence people and to dominate over others and to go to war and to, to various things that we know are just adharmic. No sensible, God-loving person would go near those things or have anything to do with them because of the karma involved in them. But these beings now are thinking, well, <clears throat> I might be able to skip the whole shoot mess there and just control, control the heavens, control the worlds inside of me. I see now that there's a connection to the inside. Now I want to manipulate that. Prakriti laya, it's called. You can, you know, just like in dreams, you can form these worlds, live in them, and then dissolve them and come back to earth and so forth. Well, these beings can form these worlds, live in them, and then take them into a formless state to see where their source are, and then come back and manipulate them more. So they're intensifying their enjoyment of the power in nature. And so that, that becomes a game. Accumulation of wealth first, then intensification of enjoyment. So here, physical power, Vital mental power, yogic power. Those basically are the three we're talking about. Now you realize that the first two we're talking about up here fall into this physical level and are beginning to bridge on the occult, which is a, a sticky wicket topic, the occult. We'll look at that a little deeper to see how uh, people who, if they got over the fact that they're not a name and a form and that things in nature change, that they should immediately go to God's power. They should immediately realize uh, that they're the source of all other powers, but they don't. They get attracted to the metaphysical. So they go from the physical to the metaphysical, and they never, just like most people are 
blindsided by the fact that they were born in a form and they're emotional all their lives about it. Um, like in India, I went, you don't see therapists, you just see swamis. And, you know, people aren't running to air their problems with people who have problems because they know the people with their problems can't help them with their problems because they have problems. So you go to a person who doesn't have problems, a swami sitting there. And so you're sitting there with the swamis and Hindus come in with their children, they bow down to the swami, they talk, talk to them a little while, they get up and leave, and this happens all day. They're going to, to spiritual teachers with their daily lives matters and clarifying them every day. So, you know, people here are just emotional babies and uh, reacting to everything that happens to them because, because part of the problem of, of believing in nature is you think that nature is the only reality. That's, in Vedanta, that's called the world's real. Well, before we even look at these, let's look at some of these ego-based thoughts. This will clear the matter. First ego-based thought is God does not exist. So you're just pretty much a rank materialist. And nature is your go-to for that. There is no soul. So then there's no entity uh, uh, except this undefined ego personality inside of yourself, which is trying to monopolize everything. Worldly knowledge is best, and that's going to happen to the intellectual too, because they don't know about um, jnana, vijnana yet. They don't know that there's something beyond um, ignorance and knowledge as a duality that they can go to that's a clarifier for this delusion. So these thoughts are, you need to think about these thoughts just as normal thoughts in people's heads. This is what's going around their head if they would care to think. If, if they bring any concentration to the thought process at all, these are the conclusions they'll walk away with. So matter is all there is. That's a, that's a real hard one for somebody who's looked into spirituality as being the goal of human existence and enlightenment as being the highest aim of human life. Uh, and when other people are thinking entirely the opposite, that matter is, and somehow they're going to be able to you know, take that with them to some heaven that they don't even know exists yet because they haven't seen it, which is religion is trying to foist upon them. I seek only my own good. Basically, that's the ego-based ego thought. It's not out for the altruism, for the good of others, but it's really there just to satisfy its own urges and desires. I am better than others comes hand in hand with that. Ignorance is bliss. So if they do run into anyone who has some higher perspective, they're going to prefer to uh, their own ignorance to the knowledge of an outside influence. Whereas we know that many of us, when we ran into a, a person from the East who had, was in the possession of something yogic or something Vedantic or something Tantra or something Tibetan Buddhist, that we immediately responded, really? That's interesting. Tell me about that. And then some of us launched on the path because of that encounter with somebody who was thinking higher. But no. Uh, Ignorance is bliss otherwise. The body's health is paramount, but of course the body's health is also impossible. Impossible. You can live in the body for, for a long time and enjoy periods of health, but then periods of disease are going to come as a result. And you find yourself in the midst of them and you go, what happened to that health? Because that I thought was eternal. Oh, I see, I'm in the body. Uh, there again, consciousness has been squeezed down into this little test tube. You know, it, it thought it was an ocean. Now, a little bit of it got taken from the ocean, corked off in this test tube, and that's my body, mind mechanism. And that's who I am. Forget the whole ocean. I can't even look at the essence inside the test tube and call it mine, you know, except in an egotistic way. Along with that comes more collective delusion, like my race is superior to those of others. Only my religion is true. Objects will bring me happiness. And the thought that the ego personality 
is me. That's the real person. Uh, ironic, isn't it, that very few people will analyze their own ego. That's called being honest with yourself these days. Say, well, what a fool I am, you know, or what foolish things I did, or why have I been blind my whole life? And, and thinking these kinds of thoughts, along with my neighbors, you know, sharing the Maya with them over the fence, as I used to say, every day, and with no awakening happening. So these are some of these ego-based thoughts that uh, one could make a list of and say, I'm going to transcend those and see what it's like on the other side of the fence. See what it's like to live in a mind that has illumined thoughts or more enlightened thoughts, at least. And then store up some of that. As we're getting to that idea of storing up yogic power. Well, here's some of the things along with these thoughts that go along with physical power as it's contrasted to yogic power and also uh, what falls between it, which is called um, psychic power. Psychic power is what we're coming to that's very difficult to uh, rid people of the notion of. I mean, I had to get over my attraction to the beauty of nature. Then I had to get over my, my um, desire to store up atomic energy for money, for pleasure, for all those things, before I could even get to the problem of occult power. Um, I don't even know what the metaphysical is because I only believe in matter. So how can I even know that these powers of the occult are about, are, are lurking in my own consciousness, about to pounce on me and waylay me further and delude me in a greater way? So this is what's in store for people and um, why people beat a hasty retreat out of the worlds of name and form, never to be born again. As Holy Mother said, I, birth and death, life, very painful. I hope you never have to experience them again. So these are things coming from the lips of people who have transcended these ways of thinking and these, this mass of suffering that you see all around you in the world, like when we just traveled, people suffering everywhere. And then you come home and it's right next door. Um, that's what they'll say. You know, there's, there's a grand solution for all of this. You know, make sure that you're never born here again. So, but if you believe that nature is the only reality, how is that possible? Because that's all, you were born in nature already. And you're having a hard time believing in a rebirth, you see. I could have, I almost put that in that list. This is this, we only live one lifetime. That's another egoic thought based delusion. We only live one lifetime. That's, you've been having so many lifetimes, you can't shake a stick at all of them. And that's why you have so many relations and, and why you have so many memories and unfortunately so many negative samskaras and karma attached to this planet and it won't wake up. Like Sharma Krishna said, harder to wake up a worldly person than to drive a sword into the back of a crocodile. You know, it's not just us that are you know, aware of the difficulty of awakening, but these great souls who have a lot of stored up power, they're having a hard time convincing people away from this kind of ideation that, that, that is just deluded. Why would you even want to believe that? What to speak of? You know, somehow being seduced into believing it. It seems like if you had innate intelligence, you'd hear something like that. I don't believe that. But they're hearing truths like, you know, your soul is eternal, and they're saying, I don't believe in that. It's the opposite way. They're walking away from the truth, and they're walking right towards Maya. It's like this person, so we haven't talked about her first. So, I mean, so inside of these three kinds of power we're looking at this week, and which we might have to do a little bit more next week, there's this figure. You know, and under the ocean, and you know, there's the, the the depths and the bottoms with all the jewels and all that. And then there's this opaque, silty waters I called it here, which is the mind and its its thinking process. And then here's the surface of hazy, you know, uh, uh, physically based thinking. So the little boxes there is that floating hypnotically on the surface of matter and its enjoyment. 
based on this first kind of power in two forms. Don't forget as you go through this, when you think back tonight and when you meditate on my class tomorrow and on Tuesday when you meditate on my class, on Wednesday after work when you come back and meditate on this class, on Thursday when you think back on it again, I hope you get my point, that you need to do manana on this class, not just hear it once and walk away. And then, you know, you, you might not even be one that's caught in the hazy waters. Are you free? Uh, are you going to add that to one of your thoughts? I'm really the Atman. I'm free, ever free. I'm never bound. And then you add to that, I was never bound. Can you do that? Can you believe that? Is it true? Were you never bound? Oh, ultimately, yes. I can, <laughs> I've heard it. But it seems like when I was sick last week and, you know, when I was younger in my 20s and when I woke up out of a night earlier than I did, it didn't seem so enlightened then, did I, you see? <laughs> so what, what happened to my grand enlightenment that it left me, that it abandoned me, that my mind betrayed me, and all of a sudden I'm this fool again, you see? First class fool. First class fool. That was one of the favorite titles my Swami gave us. You Americans are first class fools. As we were just buying into nature. You know, and here's this man standing up here who had renounced it, transcended it, didn't even believe it was real. What's to speak of somehow gathering its power? I started laughing the other night and thinking about Swami Shishan. He said, he's talking along one time, he said, and all of a sudden he tenor of his voice changed, he started speaking in these little giggles. You know, it was like, the Holy Mother sometimes did that to people. She'd have a collie laugh that she'd throw out to you and scare the bejesus out of people who thought they knew her. They were talking about war in Europe, and she started giggling like a maniac. And then people were looking at her like, who, is that coming out of her? You know, she was laughing at the death of people dying in battlefields. That's Mother Collie's laugh. So my Swami's version of that one day was that, you know, he said, oh, and then there was this man that came to me and asked us, oh yeah, I, yes, that's the man who wanted the Cadillac car. And, you know, so then he, there's a silence in the room and he goes, tee -hee, tee -hee, he, he wanted a Cadillac car. And like, like thundering horses out of nowhere, little bits of laughter started taking over this group watching Swami Shishnanaji, as he sit there started giggling inside himself about the ludicrousy of this man wanting to get this pile of nuts and bolts so badly, you know, and drive it around. A Cadillac car was just the most strangest thought to this, this 90-year-old sannyasin from India who had renounced everything. And somehow he managed to convince everybody in about five or ten seconds that that was the funniest thing that ever happened. I have a recording of it. You can just hear the whole room break into laughter. For like five minutes, they laughed. And then they'd recover and laugh some more. And so it was very hard to continue on with the lecture because of this the idea of this American man, Western man, wanting a Cadillac car. So that's the shock, you know, of, of all of a sudden immediately being able to abandon the position of all your desires that you think you want so much because they're all based on nothing. Get the car, it breaks down, it wears out, you know, it pollutes, I mean, you know, hang it as an albatross around your son's neck, you know, for the next generation. Whatever is going to happen to it, you know? <clears throat> I just had a mechanic tell me that. He worked on an Alpha, not an Austin Healey, for 17 hours over three days to try and replace a gas pump in one of its tanks. And you know, and he uh, uh, said you know, he couldn't even see where he was working. He had a mirror down inside. 17 hours inside of this car for this person who wanted this Austin Healey fixed. Right up here, up the street. And that person is deciding to give it to his son. Here, you take this package of problems. Next time a gas tank falls apart, the mechanic is going to be gone already. You know, we'll find another person to do that. So anyway, I digress, but basically floating hypnotically on the surface of matter and its, and its enjoyment. 
that's what this, this person is just naturally, buoyantly going to the surface of things. Unfortunately, the surface is not the light of Brahman. It's the depths where you'll find the darkness, or, or if you want to say, the brilliant darkness of, of, of Brahman. In the depths, dive deep, O mind, dive deep into the ocean of God's beauty. If you descend to the uttermost depths, there you will find the gems of love and knowledge and wisdom and peace, as the song sings in India. So the second box here, uh, this for the second kind of powers is drifting helplessly in the opaque, silty waters of heavenly projection and selfish intellectual conception. So you can see then how the shift is made from the attraction of beauty to just a naive little person, you know, just enjoying my life in time as time floats by. But, you know, my life in the current of time is about to end at any moment, but I'm not thinking about that right now. To all of a sudden is, how can I get more out of life? And if I have any intelligence in the matter, or I have uh, a family member who became a physicist or something like that, or a doctor, you know, basically now I can start to uh, gather the elements. I can start to covet them. I can start to amass them. How many tanks can I, can I have this year you know, for my battles in other countries? And so forth, and and how much gas do I need? You know, just suck from the earth in order to fuel those tanks to kill those people, so that I can dominate over all the worlds. And this isn't even yet to the level of the demigods. It's still out here with human souls who believe in physical matter only. They still haven't seen that um, there's a class of being that can actually master the heavens and and dominate over them like the demigods do over the ancestors, like the gods do over the demigods. There's a pecking order inside too, not just out here. And this is what's getting into what's called, in, you know, the intellectual, the silty waters. Uh, there's no real clarity there in the intellect yet. It hasn't seen its own power, that's for sure. Because that, you know, We'd want to bring that as in as a refreshing teaching, but I'm not going to do that for you yet. I want you to suffer really long and hard about this attraction to nature that you see all around you, and that maybe some tendrils are still existing in your own mind, and you can just finally say, earth, air, fire, water, and ether, seeing, tasting, touching, hearing, and smelling. Um, I've had 40, 50, 60, 70 years of it. And, you know, why do I want any more, especially if it means it ends in suffering? If, I, if I've learned that lesson late in life, uh, you know, if, I've, if I can learn it early, then that's another matter. You see, I have some chance to, to face off with the demons of the occult powers and, and, and acquire Dharma Mega Samadhi. Because that's what the father of these yogic powers said. If you can get... If you can um, resist the onslaught of the eight occult powers, then you'll get Dharma Mega Samadhi. Mega, you know, Dharma Mega. You get this huge field of teachings that back in, in the Rishi's time was called Atmigyan, and later on, you know, was called Vigana. In Buddhist time, it was called the Dharmakaya. There's this huge field of teachings that's available to you in the depths. And, you know, this is living, intelligent power. This isn't, this isn't occult power with some uh, shining with some other light. You know, there, the sun does not shine, nor the moon, nor stars, nor lightning, nor fire. There, only the light of the Atman shines. And all these other lights light up because of it. Natatra Suryabhadi. Suryabhati Natatra Natatra uh, Chandra Tarakam. So it's not the light of the sun, moon, stars, fire. That's the that's the light that's attracting me at these physical and occult levels. But it's the light of the Atman that's the real light. It's the only living, intelligent light, and you get to it by storing up your power in the practice of yoga. You can hear about it in the Vedanta. 
And if you're ex uh, exceptionally wise and adept and facile, then you can you can stick to the Vedanta Darshana and get realization and illumination, particularly if you put it together with your chosen ideal, right? Chosen ideal. So that's one of the other things. And by the way, that's rather tantric when you say that. So that's one of the other ways in which some of us, oh, I don't think I want to practice everything that's in the gospel, like Babaji said. I think I'm just going to go to the mother. He talks about her too. So I'm going to take this Vedantic wisdom of Advaita and I'm going to take it to Mother and say, help me understand this quickly in one lifetime. I'm drowning, you see. Save me from these, these tepid waters, you know, these, these fake depths of, of power that, that are, are luring thousands and thousands of people into things like Anam Alagim of Yapti, Prakami of Shipta, Mahit, and so forth. We can look at those because there's a whole chart on them. Let's look at this third box as we uh, use these three boxes and this figuring at these different levels of the waters of existence, you might say, to further define what we're looking at here in terms of these three kinds of power. We need to look at these powers and say, I eschew them. I'm the power. I have the power. It's not in nature. It never was. The power that's in nature started out in me. However you want to approach this through uh, Vedantic axioms, which is why the Vedanta puts side by side with the yoga is very good, because if you've already heard your, your guru talk about you know, these great rules of, 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 uh, of Advaita Vedanta, uh, you know, and then like like a Swami Vivekananda, and you're already aware that these are accepted truisms in India. And then when you start practicing yoga, you have all the foundation you need for that yogic power to turn into something that's storing up in you, that, that you can utilize against uh, anything that's um, that's a that could act as an obstacle or an impediment or a blockage you know, to your inner realization. The grantees, for instance, in a way of ascending the lotuses. Uh, however you want to put this, because Kundalini is an, yet another system to look at in the, in the warp and woof of this. But here's uh, the depths. Unfortunately, it's not put in a way that's very positive. <laughs> Failing to dive deep to procure the gems of conscious Shakti power lying at the depths of refined human awareness. So at least it's stated that these gems of Shakti power are lying deep within you, within your own waters. You're this ocean of consciousness. How can you be separate from it? Are you a raindrop only? Are you just a river? Or are you the whole ocean? Dreaming yourself to be a river, dreaming yourself to be a raindrop, or dreaming yourself to be a little vial full of silty water called the body-mind mechanism, you're the entire thing. And uh, those have already been told you, as they said. They've already been told to you as, as axioms. So those three boxes are these easy, simple ways that I put in here with this metaphor and this, this image to explain some of the technical things that are, that are happening here. None of this is all that hard to understand because people all around you are suffering it all the time and they're still suffering it. This is something that we want others to awaken to is why we sit here for an hour or more on any given day trying to uh, give forth this perspective, if perspective it is. Because I just went to a place where people are living in that. So I can come back to here and, and say, you know, they weren't in any kind of hypnotization by nature. They weren't courting occult powers. Um, they weren't trying to amass wealth. That wasn't anywhere in their minds. And, and I sat next to them and just had these wonderful talks and felt this peace and bliss. And this is the way their life goes every day, you see. It's not just, oh, I think I'll be sattvic today and then throw it all to the four winds tomorrow and be rajasic. Every day is like this. It's, 
The equanimity of mind is the thing to attain. Peace of mind is what you need first and foremost. It's true. So when you see it, you're amongst a society of people who are like that, and you've spent any time yourself doing any kind of storing of power in your own practice over 10, 20, 40, 50, in my Swami's case, 80 years, then it's going to be impossible not to notice that this is what people need to learn. That you can talk about lust and anger and greed and envy and pride and, and shame and fear and the six passions and the eight fetters and the five kleshas and the nine antaryas and, you know, you can go into all of these various teachings of the different darshanas, even just of India alone, which is a lot. Or you can just waken up simply to the fact that uh, you've been, you've been uh, caught up in the delusion that you're a name and a form through an insentient power that actually dwells inside of you, that you utilize to trap yourself. Because people are getting free from this. People are waking up and getting free from it. They're having insights. That's the other part we want to, you know, quickly mention. It's like it's not all such a opaque, hazy, silty water kind of thing. It's that people are finding clear water inside themselves when they hear the truth of Vedanta. That's why Swamiji brought it first and foremost. And then we read the gospel and say, hey, that looks quite tantric to me. Oh, yeah, what's tantra, you see? I said, well, he's listing Lord Copula here with the 25 cosmic principles. What's that about? Okay, we'll take you that direction. So you fill in your knowledge. The more you fill in your knowledge, the less the waters of ignorance can get in you know, to your once leaky vase. See, you, what you store up stays. What happens here? must stay here. You know, so, so basically, if you get into darshan with these, these great souls, um, you don't have to say, you know, keep this a secret, because uh, everyone else is, is uh, not seeking it. It's between you and your guru. Uh, actually, eventually it should become between you and your soul, not your personality, your real person, and your purusha. That's who you should be listening to. Did Bob, what Bhaji said, was that really true? It's really still shocking. I still can't, can't quite believe it all. You know, it's everyone's just living naturally in nature here with the five senses and five elements. Everyone's making a living. Everyone's doing this and that. And yes, they're all going to hospitals. They're all dying in wars in at least two or three different places on earth today. More coming. And they're all uh, making... Uh, lots of money and amassing it and not giving away to worthy causes. All of that's going on at the same time, but they're living these so-called everyday ordinary lives. How do we turn wealth into health? This last week's God blog. So Holy Mother says, feed a holy person, give to a worthy cause, and give to a holy person who's doing that kind of work then you're actually contributing because you're living amongst so much opulence yourself in an ideal society where people aren't becoming fulfilled by that opulence. Like your, like your parents, they died, you know, unfulfilled. Nature couldn't satiate them. Objects couldn't satiate them. Enjoyments could not satiate them. So are they just going to come back again? What if they didn't believe in rebirth, like say my father? If it's not even a possibility in his mind, then if he does come back, he's going to come back unawares that he's been born, just like he was in the last lifetime. Did you ever think of that? It's not just like what I think I become, it's what I don't think is what I fall victim to. So there are people walking around here by hundreds of thousands in this country alone, on this collection of islands we're just sitting in here right now, who um, don't believe in rebirth, rebirth because in their last lifetime they didn't. They, well, I don't believe in it again. They're born again. I still don't believe in it, you see. <laughs> oh, and look at that beautiful Cadillac car go by. You know, so it's, it's like <clears throat> the wake-up call is not being given. So this person's running out of air. 
and she needs to go, you know, leave the surface after taking a deep Vedic breath, or tantric breath, or eight limb yoga breath, not a hot yoga breath, please, and dive to the bottom here, see, and and gather up the gems that are lying, Shakti power gems that are lying at the base of her own being, always have been, always will be, never will not be. It's always the case, and it's always the truth, and it's eternal. And uh, so, I'm not sure what time we have, but we were able to cover this much. Let's read these five points, and then we can say that in this first class we worked our way through these two, this first, actually, delineation of power that has everything to do with nature. First is beauty, then it's inherent force. It's very important to understand that because um, um, naive people, emotional people and so forth, they're, they're taking refuge in nature and its beauty. And it doesn't last very long when forests get deforested and oceans get polluted and the body gets unhealthy. It's a false refuge. And it's, it, these days it's even becoming less and less permanent and has less and less longevity. But the other persons are going in another direction. It's being deforested. It's being, uh, the minerals are being taken out of it. The oil's being sucked from it. I want some of it. That's the leaning towards a cult. Because that's going to give you all these things that are unhealthy thoughts by which you can dominate over others right here. You see, the very first and most important of the occult powers is to dominate other over other people. And it's got its strongest hold in this day and age, particularly in the West. Uh, we want to just refuse it, refute it. That kind of action, we don't accept it. We are ahimsis, not himsis. We're ahimsis and homsas. See? We're, we're, we're the children of, of Divine Mother, whose very essence is peace, love, light, compassion, empathy, helpfulness. A person a couple days ago helped me for three hours, and the person who was in pain just stood there helping me. Three hours with patience and perseverance until the job was done. And I was like, Laura and I was just saluting, calling in the morning, you know, salutations to the divine mechanic. You know, what you did was just amazing. Hard to see that thing nowadays anymore. So this is what we, we have to do. We have to be just, like he said at the end, I, oh, I don't want any money. I'm just generous with my time right now. See, I feel generous with my time. Time and money, isn't it really the whole thing? And it's in part and parcel of the negative side of, your, of these powers. But it can be turned from wealth into health, and from, from health into higher health, and deeper health. We'll get to that. Let's read these five so we can put a capper at least on a third of this topic. This is the topic, by the way, that has to do with um, uh, storing up power. So if you're going to practice yoga, and you're doing it with the wrong practices and the wrong teacher, one of my long-time complaints here in the West particularly, then you've got to have a reorientation. You have to have a, a new mindset about this and uh, find an authentic teacher with a path that leads to its goal and follow it to the end in a one-pointed fashion. Ishta Nishta is India's proclamation. One path, one teacher till you reach the goal. No wild fox Zen like in Japan, like the the Zen people talk about following many paths, many mantras. You can take different darshanas, but you have to do it under that one heading, that one teacher, like say, you're fortunate to have knowledge of Sri Ram or Krishna Paramahamsa. So that's your eternal guide, your eternal friend. So basically, um, this is all being done in that idea of this first power with its two aspects. I hope that's understood, right? So that we're not confusing the three powers because those three powers will get divided later. But the first power has two aspects to it, beauty and, and force. And that's what my point is. That's what people are 
attached to. So many of the other problems that we're talking about as, you know, in the practice of yoga would go away if those would go away. And they get increased because they don't. So oh, I'm still working so hard on my anger, but I'm still so mad, you know, because you, know, you haven't cleared the mind of, of you know, why, why you're mad at yourself for being born. Why you're mad at being born in ignorance. Why you're mad at a society for polluting. Why are you mad at people for killing each other? You know, that's that, you know, dumbstruck, blindsided soul that has to run to a therapist or something to try and clear things up. You see, but Ram Prasad has seen that um, hoping for help from professionals and family provides no real solution. Everyone just lives in pallid imitation of everyone else. So he's seen that. And what are they living in pallid imitation of? Exactly what we're talking about here. They can't even get below the surface of the waters, beauty and power. Uh, interesting that you can find beauty and power at its source in the treasures of the Godhead. Those very things are there. So what happened to, what kind of distortion did the collective mind and the individual mind go for, through to take these original powers, Ashvarya, power of God, turn it into a power for something insentient, and something ben detrimental to others? What happened? You see? And why am I a victim of it? And why am I making others a victim of it? It has to be disallowed. Plain and simple. So if they're caught in that, this would be sort of a reading of a riot act of why. They, mastering the five elements for purposes of increasing personal wealth. It happens to people who say they believe in God, and it happens to people who say they don't believe in God. Wealth is their God. That's why. Coveting the objects of nature for enhancement of sensual pleasure. Uh, this one is connected, the first one's connected more back to power of nature. The second one's connected more back to beauty of nature, right? Because I want to have sensual experiences with the beauty of nature. Time for a suntan. I'm going to go relax. Now, the Holy Mother said that, take a little time to relax today, my, my, my child. Then get back on your studies, you know. Then start storing up power again. You never know when that little bit of pleasure caused another little crack in your mind vase. And you're not seeing what's leaking out of it overnight in your waking, dreaming, and deep sleep states. Or, you know, have to go back later and patch it up in the next lifetime, like people are trying to do. Oh, it'll hold now. <laughs> like that Cadillac car. It'll hold now. Fashioning devices and inventions in order to expand individual influence. So this is, this is beginning to be leaning more toward the power of the ego, which we read the riot act of over here already. So somebody's personal influence. You see how odious it is? You know, to think that somebody would sit there and all of a sudden think, I'm going to get all of this and hoard it to myself. Just, just what a horrible thought that is, like an ogre. You, you hear about it in fairy tales, but find out later that it's actually, those are people in those fairy tales, in those forests. And that they would actually not only hoard it for themselves, but that they wouldn't give it away to anyone else. Oh, did you see that hungry man come to the monastery yesterday? And he, all he wanted was a handful of rice. And the monks wouldn't stir themselves and go and give him a handful of rice. They sent him away with, you know, with, with, uh, they were irritated by him. They couldn't rouse themselves out of their monastic life and just give him a handful of rice, Holy Mother said. This really irritated her. It wasn't like, oh, you know, he's poor. He's come upon hard times. It's his own karma. And, you know, he'll, he can go somewhere else. This is one of her children. And she used to say, you know, don't you know I eat through all your mouths? If, if that man doesn't get fed, I don't get fed. In one of my lifetimes, I might not get fed. 
So, you know, this is that odious. Can't think of a better word right now than, you know, uh, attitude or ideation that occupies these narrow minded human beings, if you want to call them that. That's just, again, not acceptable, disallowed, rejected, sorry. And then I'm going to fash, fashion des devices and inventions which will help me do this better. Get the, the next level of bulldozer out there so I can dig deeper, or the next stronger laser so that I can you know, mine more of that titanium and uranium for the next big explosion in someone else's country. And finally, he says, attempting to integrate aspects of nature's power in order to elevate the personality. So I can think of a few people right now who do that, that are very rich, very wealthy, infinitely wealthy. They don't need more money. And they're just mining the minerals out of the earth. That's what they do. Their companies do that. And um, there's no, uh, no stopping it. Oh, there's plenty of excuses to do it. Oh, it's got a workforce now, got to feed their families. So this Mayak procedure in samsara just can go on without the slightest uh, deviation from the norm. In, in palate imitation of everyone else. That's what they do, that's what I'm going to do. But I just met, you know, a handful of people that don't do that. They don't imitate others. They sit in their own Atman and talk about it and help others, feed others, counsel others, without a word of this, except maybe to talk people out of um, the deluded way of thinking about it. So uh, I'm saying not too bad as far as our progress on this delineation of the three powers because we worked our way through one, two aspects of one complete one. We'll look at this interesting phenomenon of cult powers later because it's an ancient teaching, but the way I've been teaching it for decades now is that it's upon us. Um, you know, in, in everything we do, those old Astabala cities are manifesting themselves through us, like save beautification, then, you know, that's one of make yourself look good to others, maybe when you're not. <laughs> Cosmetics, you know, I mean, you can just collect, connect the dots from the old occult powers to what's going on in industry today. And you see that just the occult powers haven't changed whatsoever. It's not an ancient teaching. It's what people got seduced by in nature. For, for starters. So that's something to be thought about first and foremost uh, before we come to this idea is that when we want to start storing up power, we want to get it from the source that's pure. Because that's been a, a mistake, long-standing mistake in humanity, sucking power from impure sources. And um, you know, it can you know, happen physically, emotionally, mentally, intellectually, and egotistically, right? So we probably want to put a stop to the kinds of power that we're getting from those things, including the elements and the five senses. And if you read your Yoga Sutras, first thing Patanjali talks about is that senses and the elements and their connection, and uh, how to purify them. So the next time you look at something, see something, eat something, um, or think about something with your mind, uh, you're taking in pure power, and now all you have to do is find a container with which to store it up in. Let's move on then to next week's class, and we'll go deeper into the subject. Jananim <coughs> Sharanam Devim Ramakrishnam Jagadgurum Paro Padme Toye Shritwa Pranamami Mahur Mahur Pranamami Mahur Mahur O 
Sharda, goddess divine, Ramakrishna, teacher of all, in bosom holding those lotus feet, salutations ever be of mine. Vedanta Siddhanta Nirukti Aresha Brahmaiva Jivaham Sakalam Jagadcha Akanda Rupa Stiti Areva Moksha Brahmadvitiye Shutayaha Pramanam Om Shantihi 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 It is the apt and final conclusion of the Vedanta that all is Brahman. Time, space, living beings and the world Living in constant recognition of this fact is what is called enlightenment. Brahman is pure and perfect and one without a second. And the revealed scriptures and the teachings are the sure and certain proof of this fact. Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us and may peace be unto all. Om Hari Om Hari Om Hari Om Tatsang.